Hello and welcome to Crux Investor. This morning we're going to be speaking with Marshall Koval, the CEO of Lumina Gold. They've got an operation down in Ecuador. Um, we're going to get an update from them. Hello, Marshall. How are you, sir? Great, Matthew. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure is ours. So, Marshall, we've been wanting to hear your story for a while. Um, so, can you give us a two-minute summary uh, of the project, an uh, elevator pitch, if, if you will? Yeah, so Lumina Gold Corp is uh, an offshoot of the Lumina Group, and you'll know the Lumina Copper story from uh, the past. Ross Beatty developed that company, so it's the same group, and um, it's the same basic business model as Lumina Copper, basically adding value to projects, de-risking them. These are generally large projects. The uh, Congrejos project that we have in Ecuador is a large uh, gold copper porphyry system. And through the Lumina copper story, we're uh, pretty good at porphyry systems. So the idea here is to add value, de-risk it, do the technical work we need to. But these type of projects are large capital cost projects. So ultimately we're an explorer developer and we've advanced uh, the Congreos project since 2014. We've completed a PEA study on the project and uh, now we're in the field doing all the field work, drilling, engineering um, related to a pre-feasibility study should we decide to move forward with one. Thanks for that summary. Um, I guess it would be pertinent to start with uh, understanding a little bit about you, your background, how you got involved with the project. Sure. So as far as uh, the Lumina Group goes, I've been involved since 2014. I've uh, been a business partner in all of the Lumina Group endeavors. Uh, personally, I'm a geologist by profession. I've got 40 years experience in the industry. A lot of it has been with major mining companies, um, engineering companies, and uh, prior to joining the Lumina Group, I was uh, president of Pincock Allen and Holt, which is uh, an engineering company that did a lot of work on project finance as an independent engineer for banks on major projects like Batu Hijau, Los Palombres, Antamina. So uh, my background is more in engineering development. I've been involved in building mines. So that's kind of the thumbnail sketch. Okay, Marshall, so tell us a bit about the board. There's some pretty big names associated with it. Ross Beatty, obviously. So, uh, you know, who, who put this thing together? So, uh, you know, this was uh, a Lumina Group effort and, you know, Ross, and then we have quite a few long-term investors that have been involved with the story. Uh, Rick Gruel, Aziz Sharif, um, management owns quite a bit of the Ross and management owns quite a bit of the company, about 27 and a half percent. I've got about 4% of the company myself. So we're really well aligned with shareholders. And, and that's been kind of the philosophy of all the Lumina Group companies. Right. And so and who are the active members in terms of the project itself? So uh, I act as the CEO. Scott Hicks is VP of Corporate Development. Uh, Martin Ripp is uh, the CFO. Martin's been involved with the Lumina Group companies for quite a while. Um, in country, our uh, vice president and country manager is Diego Benalcazar. He's our senior VP. Diego is an Ecuadorian geologist with substantial experience in Ecuador and internationally, and he's been a key player. And then on sort of government corporate affairs, um, John Ewell, who's been with the Lumina Group for quite a while. Leo Hathaway is, uh, is the key guy as far as geology goes. He's been uh, with Ross and myself since 2004. So we have a senior management team that's worked together on quite a few of these projects, uh, both through Lumina Copper and today. Right, and how do you, how do you deal with the local issues? Because you, you spend a bit of time in your deck talking about that. Obviously, it's a fairly new mining jurisdiction. So how's that work? Yeah, I mean, basically, um, I'm directly involved myself a lot with the government relations and actually in the field with, with the communities as well. Um, Diego uh, Ben Alcazar, country manager, is real key. Um, he's based in Ecuador. Uh, John Ewell, our uh, VP of government affairs, is down there every couple of weeks. And so basically, we've got a, a pretty robust um, corporate social responsibility team focused on community relations. And we've got quite a few people in the field in our camp, um, good relations with local communities. 
we don't have indigenous communities in the area and the, and the closest community is about seven, eight kilometers away. We have a lot of programs with them, several employees, and it's primarily agricultural areas. So a big focus of the company is on uh, CSR and community relations, as I mentioned. Right, okay. And, and, and given the team has been together for a while, um, this is a long t- this is a long term play um, in terms of getting this thing to the production, but that's not necessarily your end game. So, can you explain what your business plan is? Right. Yeah. So basically, we acquired the asset in two thousand and four. We were an early mover in Ecuador. Uh, we saw things were changing. Um, we did a lot of work compilation and and put a big portfolio together. And then you probably saw last year in August we split Luminex resources out of Lumina Gold, and that was more earlier stage copper projects. And subsequently, Luminex has um, deals with BHP that we're working on now, with Anglo-American and with First Quantum. And that's more of an early uh, stage exploration play. So the philosophy with Lumina Gold is that this is a development project. It's on the development pathway. It's large. Uh, Right now, we have four drill rigs in the field and, and we're drilling. We're doing exploration drilling. We have a new discovery area called Gran Bestia um, that's separate from the main Congrejos deposit. And I I can give you a bit more details later. And um, we're doing the geotechnical, hydrogeologic, environmental work. um, Also doing a pretty robust metallurgical testing program. And and we're supporting all that with these four drill rigs. So, so far this year, we've drilled about uh, just shy of 8,000 meters. And it's been divided between Grand Bestia deposit where we have about six drill holes and plus 200 meters of drilling. And that's really exciting because it's got the potential to change the whole project, make it even bigger. You know, the PEA had about a 400 million ton project that we had identified. Um, So it was roughly a 16 year mine life. And uh, there's a lot of things beneficial of the project in Ecuador. It's close to a port facility. It's close to infrastructure, power roads that sort of thing that'll help the project. So back to your start of your question, the idea here is to continue to understand the magnitude of the project, to de-risk it technically, socially, environmentally, and then move the project on to somebody that would build it. You know, we're looking at initial capital cost on the project of over $800 million, uh, and then an expansion in year five that would require another $400 million roughly. So. Um, it's a big dollar project and, you know, we're a one asset company, a junior developer. So, you know, it, it's logical that a major or mid tier uh, producer would take it on and build it. So, so if I just understand that, you, you, obviously the, the management, the board, friends and family have got about 27 and a half percent of the business. Um, the, who, who holds the rest? So Ross and the management own the 27.5%. And then I would say friends and, and family beyond that put us close to uh, 50%. And we have a lot of long-term investors that have followed the company, uh, the Lumina Group through Lumina Copper. Um, and it's pretty strong investor base in Canada, the U.S., and Dubai. Um, that's been a lot of the history of, of the people that have followed us. Right. Okay. And that, in that context, they're high net worths or are they retail? Uh, there, there's a bit of both. We also have some funds involved. You know, we have uh, a couple funds out of California and in Canada and New York that are following us. So, um, but we do have a retail base. Um, you know, we just uh, recently listed on the OTCQX in the U.S. to try to get a broader um, investor base in the U.S. So. So I would say there's a mix of all of the above. So I mean, the reason I ask about the shareholding and uh, the, the type of shareholders is the, the plan, the business plan, as explained by you, it seems to be we're going to drill a whole bunch more and sort of work out the size of what we've got. But how do you put that in the context of explaining to existing shareholders and, or new shareholders coming in what the plan is for creating value? Sure. So, you know, the, I, I mentioned uh, the Congrejos deposit and, and we're still, we still haven't totally defined that. That's the main deposit for the project and uh, we're drilling it now. So basically there's an opportunity for that main deposit to grow. 
But Grand Bestia, which is about a kilometer to the northwest, um, isn't included in our resource that we used in the PEA. And we've got some really long drill intercepts that are above the cutoff grade that were included in the mine plan in the PEA. So it looks like we have either a satellite deposit that'll be a, a new starter pit for us, or it'll add mine life to the project. So basically, if you look at it, um, the PEA resource, we had about 8.5 million ounces of gold and a billion pounds of copper. So this thing is a really large scale. So and it's growing and it, it's got the potential to bring the Grand Bessie deposit in. So if you look at where we're at in the market as far as share price, you know, we're, we're trading at a really high discount to NAV and there's a lot of upside and, and we haven't unfolded the whole story as how large this deposit is. And uh, this is formerly a Newmont project. So what we would anticipate is as we start to understand the larger nature of this and, and de-risk it, that there'll be a lot of upward movement in the share price potential with a with a gold price environment that's increasing. And you know, we did the economics of the project at 1300 gold and uh, 325 copper. So that's roughly where we're trading um, in the market today. And there's a lot of optionality to the project. So if we go up to $1,400 gold, for instance, the project gets a lot bigger. So the upside is, um, being able to come in now and, and, and low point in the market or relatively low point, we moved up a bit since last year. And then as we uh, add value and de-risk this, um, the potential to move up and ultimately uh, dispositioning the company with a, a buyout. Okay. I mean, if, I mean, you touched upon a couple of, a couple of points there. I mean, you've, you've put the numbers in there at, well, 1400 on page seven, 1300 on page 11 on, on the gold and, as you say, yeah. you know, the, the, the copper price is also quite well priced uh, considering the, yeah. you know, today, today's pricing. Why, why have you shown the numbers using those, the, those uh, high prices? Do you think it's justified? Well, basically, the, uh, this study was done back uh, mid last year. And at, at the time, those prices, we looked at analyst estimates, we looked at consensus and um, looked at uh, pricing going forward. And that seemed like a good place to be. At the time when we released it, gold was about 1350. Um, and then when we did most of the work, and then when we released it, it moved down towards the 1300 and a bit below. Will you, will you be releasing uh, an updated PowerPoint with you know, slightly more discounted gold and copper numbers, or are you gonna stick with what, what's in the deck? So what, what I think we would do in the current market is, is be right in the same ballpark. And you know, our plan right now is um, to update the resource in the second half of uh, 2019. And then we have most of the field work done in the metallurgy and basic engineering that we can move to a pre-feasibility study. And you know, that would roughly take another, uh, another year beyond the release of the resource estimates. So, you know, my, my viewpoint is the current gold price would, would make sense uh, at this point in time to do the next study. But I think so generally your peers would, you know, share a price around 1100, 1150 in, in the deck. I just wondered why you hadn't. Um, and again, with the, with the PEA, do you feel that that's quite an aggressive number or you feel that's a, you know, fair in relation to um, what you've got? Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a fair number. Uh, Basically, a lot of engineering backup went into this. I mean, you see a lot of, you know, my background is uh, running engineering companies and, and serving as independent engineer for banks on, on projects. So the way we look at a PEA is it's a full industry scoping study. Um, we do a lot of engineering backup to support it. And then we extract the, uh, the results from the PEA and uh, results from the scoping study and put those into the PEA. Right, okay. Because again, you know, the IRR is at the moment using you know, high gold number, a PEA, which typically you know, with my investor hat on, I'm, I'm gonna go yeah. plus or minus 30%. Um, you know, the IRRs right now, they're not complementary to what you feel you've got. Is that, because, again, coming back to, we need to be, think as investors, we need to be thinking this is a long-term play Basically, when you look at large projects of this sort of scale, to get a project like this up to, a, say, a 20% IRR, 
which uh, we show um, in the deck uh, at, a, at, I believe it was $1,400 gold price roughly. The, uh, it, you know, there's very few large scale projects like this that, that end up with those kind of RRR, IRRs. So we feel pretty good and, and obviously we're trying to de-risk it and improve the economics with the work that we're doing with a target to move up towards, uh, you know, that 20% IRR range um, with the discount rates as we showed them in, in the PEA. Right, so I guess I'm, tr I'm trying to get the balance between getting in early with some potential upside as you build out the resource, because you're talking, it's a very large district-wide uh, body you're, you're, you're working with here. Um, it's, this is not a small company or a small asset, because there, there are more attractive grades out there. They're more attractive, immediate, you know, seemingly immediate returns with lower costs associated with them. I mean, how are you selling this to people? I mean, when you're when you're talking to investors, what what are you saying to them? Well, I mean, it's still a growth story as we speak right now. Like I mentioned earlier, with the exploration works on, and you know, like I say, Ecuador is evolving and it's becoming a, a premier mining destination and. The sovereign risk related with Ecuador has gone down substantially. I mean, we've seen in the time that we've been in the country, um, the, the royalty rate, um, the windfall tax disappear, the royalty rate reduce, the tax re fiscal tax regime reduce, so that you've attracted majors, like I mentioned earlier, BHP, Anglo, uh, First Quantum, Newcrest. So, so basically, it's one of the last... Um, uh, systematically unexplored um, jurisdictions in Latin America and probably the world. So, so basically, the upside for investment investors are participating in the early stage of the project. The project has enough legs that will likely be built as a mine uh, in the future. And uh, we're doing all the work we can to identify the scale of it, which is, is looks like it's growing at this point, de-risking it, putting in place the permitting, and, you know, if you compare it to a lot of the, you know, if I, let me just scroll through the deck here for a second. This is kind of important to, um, to go to uh, page 14. Basically, what we did here is we looked at uh, gold producing projects that have the potential of over 250,000 ounces a year. And on this slide, what you'll see is um, projects in blue and then projects in yellow. So basically, Congrejos is the fifth largest glo global development project controlled by an independent developer. And all the blue ones are majors and mid-tiers. And if you look at how it stacks up, you know, the project um, is, is significant. I mean, we have about 373 thousand ounces of gold production a year. What are the assumptions that that's based on? Well, that's based on the PEA study and that, that's the economics that we did in the PEA study. So basically, if you go to, um, let me scroll around a little bit more here, the slide on number 11, let me just walk through the PEA metrics real quick and, and you get a feel for it. So on the bottom left on, on page 11, you know, we're looking at an initial production of 40,000 tons per annum. Um, the initial capital cost there is 831 million US. And then in year uh, five, we would finish an expansion to 80,000 tons per day. That's another 406 million of initial capital. And then the life of mine 16 years. So there's another 271 million of uh, sustaining capital. And then if you go up to the production scenario, the first five years you get 270,000 um, ounces of gold a year and 25 million pounds of copper. And then at the expansion, starting in year six through 16, it's 421,000 ounces a year for the overall average of 373. And the other aspect that the project has in its favor is, um, you know, low, uh, operating costs. So if we look at C1 cost, um, we're looking at $523 uh, an ounce. Yeah. And then if you look at ASIC on, on gold, we're looking at $569 an ounce. And then because it has copper, if you look at gold, uh, gold equivalent, our cash costs are uh, 706 C1 cost and, and 741 ASIC. So that gets us down to, um, you know, the pre-tax 
IRR of 15% and the MPV at $920 million, and that's a $1,300 goal. Now, one of the interesting aspects of this is we did this on the 5% royalty rate, and the government has just changed the scale on the royalties that you um, negotiate with an investment contract. So if we were to go to um, the 3%, the bottom rate, and they, the government did this uh, acknowledging that some of the projects like Congrejos um, don't have the high, high grades that say a Lundin Gold, uh, Fruta del Norte does. Um, so the government, if we could get 3%, that would bring the uh, post-tax MPV up to a billion dollars roughly. So you know, we're, we've had initial conversations with the government and we need to continue to move the project along to get an investment uh, agreement in place. So you know, there's, there's upside in that context. Right, but I mean, just just again for investors new to you, new to this part of the world, explain to them what large scale, low grade mining involves. Yeah, I mean, basically long mine life, and and I think um, it's an economy of scale type project, right? So, for instance, Ecuador has low power costs; it's about six cents per kilowatt hour. Um, it's a diesel producing country in its oil sector, so diesel is relatively inexpensive. Um, the project itself has a low stripping ratio. So when you look at all of these aspects um, from an operating cost, when you look at whether this project will be feasible and, and during production will it throw off, generate good free cash flow, really it comes down to two things. It's not so much the sustaining or the initial capital, it has more to do with the operating costs and the gold price, right? So we can't control the gold price environment, but we can, um, with the scale of this thing, be very effective in, in the operation of it. And so there's quite a few things going for it. That's why you see on page 11 that it's got favorable uh, cash costs, right? And when you benchmark it against a lot of other uh, gold projects um, in the world, and, you know, if we go over to... Um, Slide number 15, for instance, when we start to look at uh, average gold production versus all in sustaining costs, Congrejos, um, it ranks really well compared to its peers, you know, and, and that even includes Fruta del Norte, that's quite a bit higher grade. Uh, we're producing similar amount of gold every year. And then if you look at um, the mine life versus uh, the US dollar capital per ounce of mine, the capital efficiency, as you would say, you know, it's sort of $250 um, uh, an ounce. So that benchmarks well with peers as well. Yeah. So Congrejos, um, compared to other independent developers, is a long life, low cost asset. And, um, you know, if you go back and you look at um, page 14 again, you can see a lot of the um, high capital cost projects or a lot of the blue projects to the left of Congrejos. Um, you know, a lot of those projects are looking at quite a bit higher ca initial capital to operate. Yes. Yeah, so, um, again, help us understand this a bit better. So this is all being based off a of PEA, which is a very, well, it includes in the name, preliminary document. Um, sure. But, you know, in terms of the team's experience um, of moving projects from PEA stage, you know, the assumptions you're making, why you're... Tell us yeah. why you're confident of being able to, you know, get through to, you know, a point where someone would want to take this off your hands because the, the economics are delivered as you are um, forecasting them here. If you look at um, our history with um, the Lumina Copper story, and that's the best way to compare it. When we, um, the first major project that we advance, and it's a mine today, is the Casarones mine in Chile, and it's, it's a large uh, upper porphyry mine. Listen, we took the same approach. We went in and explored it, tried to fully define it. We went ahead and, and de-risked the project and it was uh, acquired by Pan Pacific. So the key to that was really good solid engineering exploration work so that the project was de-risked. And then we moved on. I was the CEO of Northern Peru Copper and that project was acquired by Chinaman Metals and, and Jingxi Copper. And, and what we did there is we did a PEA, real solid engineering work, um, and we were at the pre-feasibility stage and it was acquired um, you know, for $550 million US roughly. 
Um, then we were involved in the Relincio project, which is a tech project today in Chile. And that project, we had a resource estimate. We were still doing exploration drilling, very similar to where we're at with the Congrejos project. And um, tech acquired that project, and it's in the development pipeline today. And when tech acquired it, they did a lot more exploration work, in it, and it's a much larger project. Now, the ultimate one uh, that we sold was Taka Taka, the first quantum. And that project we did a P at the PEA level. Um, we took major risk areas like uh, the pre-strip, metallurgy, uh, water, <clears throat> and we advanced that work to a pre-feasibility level. And first quantum acquired the project, and, and that's next in their queue after Cobre de Panama. So that's going to move into the development scenario. So. I think um, as far as an exit goes, basically um, the level of work that's being done now should give most companies uh, comfort uh, that this project can move forward and, and be economic in the future. And obviously a lot of that depends on the, the gold price, copper price environment, but uh, you know, there's very few projects out there with this sort of scale, particularly ones that are in independent uh, developers' hands. You know, uh, so. I think that the potential for a major mid-tier to come in probably before we even complete the pre-feasibility study exists. And then ultimately, if we have to continue to move towards pre-feasibility study, we're doing all the work right now to continue to advance the project. Okay, so I'm hearing it's a large project. We've seen it before, we've done it before, and we've delivered for investors before. Exactly. Exactly. And, and I think just to, to highlight that in the Lumina copper scenario, um, we raised about 175 million and returned about 1.5 billion to shareholders. And, and I guess maybe the best way to look at that is if you flip over to um, slide number 17, um, you can see the, the tombstones for all the different companies that have been part of the Lumina group. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the senior management team and Ross have been involved in all these companies. And, and you know, that's been, our, that's been our business plan, our model, and we've been very successful at it. And, and very few companies uh, have done that. Right. I guess on, a, on another note, the Anfield Gold uh, asset that's shown there, that was merged with uh, Trek uh, and with um, Newcastle to form Equinox Gold, where Ross is the chairman. So... You know, we have a long history, we have access to capital, we have the ability to execute technically, and we have the wherewithal socially, environmentally to navigate difficult jurisdictions. And Ecuador is evolving in a really positive way. Um, and uh, we feel that we'll be successful in Ecuador as well with Lumina Gold. Yeah, no, we, we, we heard the Equinox story earlier uh, this month. Um, great story there. Uh, do you think that you know the Ross Beatty factor always helps? Because you said it just now, you don't you feel confident about being able to go and raise capital for the next stage. So on the on the money front, you've got fourteen million bucks in the in the bank now. You're gonna what are you gonna deliver in two thousand and nineteen with your cash? Basically, that cash gets us through through the year, and you know the bulk of the money is going into the ground in in Ecuador right now, related to the drilling programs, the engineering work, uh, the metallurgical work. Uh, all of that is uh, where the majority of that money is going. We run pretty thin corporate overhead. Um, so most of the money is in the ground and it's going towards de-risking and further understanding the, the extent of the uh, project, particularly understanding the new Gran Bestia area, which could be a, a project changer from the PEA. Right. Okay. Um, and are you raising any more capital this year or are you good? We, we don't anticipate it at this point. Now, basically, if you look at the history of the Lumina Group, um, we've just got uh, six holes into Grand Bestia. Newmont drilled five holes. We just finished a hole that was some 800 meters uh, deep, and uh, we hit mineralization through it, and we're in the process of um, really getting into the Grand Bestia area. Now, if we continue to have good success there, we may bring more drill rigs in, and that's the history. Like if you look at the Taka Taka project, we started with one drill rig and ultimately ended up with 10 drill rigs. So that's the only thing, continued success there that could change um, the spend 
uh, for the year. And if that happened, we would uh, evaluate where we sat cash wise and determine if we need to go back to the market. Marshall, our investors want to know how you're going to make them money. How, do you, how can you answer that question? Yeah, I think basically one of the main ways to uh, look at that is we still haven't dis discovered the full scale of this project. And, and I think what I want to do is direct you over to uh, slide number 10 in the deck. And I think this really um, shows you the upside here, which isn't realized in the market at this point. And basically, if you look at the right side of slide number 10, that is uh, the Congreos deposit. And basically what you see on this slide is um, the pinkish color is all of the gold equivalent grades between 0.35 and 0.85. That's all above the cutoff grade that would go into the mine plan in the PEA. And then the, the hot red color there is over 0.8 grams per ton gold equivalent. And what you can see in this slide is that um, there's a significant deposit in the Grejos deposit at the right where the majority of those drill holes are. And about a kilometer to the left of that is the Grand Bestia project. And basically what you see there is um, five of the uh, Newmont holes and, and two, of, um, two of our holes. Subsequently, we, we drilled four more holes and this thing's holding together. What we don't know is if these, uh, this is a true satellite deposit, if the two deposits are connected and are one deposit. So if you look at that slide, there's um, this breadth outcrop at the surface which is 4.8 grams per ton gold and uh, 2.3 grams per ton silver and basically there, there's some other in, intercepts around 10 grams and this is all at the surface on the on the very edge of um, the pit which is that gray outline and listen if these two things are connected and, and we're going to drill in between we're going to fully understand the size of gram bestia which looks large at this point if these two things are connected, you've got a really large pit, which would totally change the scale and the economics of the project. Mm -hmm. So as we have it right now in the PEA, um, just the deposit at Congrejos on the right is included in the PEA. Everything to the left um, at Grand Bestia is not. So that's gonna be new resources added. And if the two are connected, it's a substantially larger deposit. So there's upside on the scale of the project, the number of gold ounces. And potentially the grades are, they seem higher at the surface. Why is that? Uh, you know, that, the outcrop at the surface, that could be a little bit of secondary enrichment uh, from the oxide near the surface. Um, but we do have good gold grades. Um, for instance, the best Grand Bestia gold grade was, uh, I believe it was hold number 99, was 208 meters of... Um, of 0.91 grams per ton gold and 1.16 uh, copper right from the surface. So, you know, like I said earlier, we're looking to see if Grand Bestia will be a higher grade near surface starter pit um, or if it'll just add resources to the mine life of the project. So there's some real upside in, in the, the scale of uh, gold ounces that could potentially be discovered here. So that's a big upside for investors. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, and do you think there's any, I mean, what, what else do you think the, companies, the company is going to be able to do this year to, again, just, just drive that market cap, drive the share price? You know, how are you promoting this, for instance? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's kind of been a, a story that um, for quite a while we've sort of been flying under the radar. We were consolidating our land position um, in the district. Now we control 100% of the known uh, mineralization at uh, Congrejos and, and Gran Bestia. And, and really, um, until we put out the PEA last year, we were pretty quiet. We had some press releases on it. Now we understand the scale of this thing is real. And um, you know we're more active uh, getting information out to the public, generating uh, more of a project definition. And, and I think there's a couple other aspects of, of the project that um, are, are really positive. Like if you look at a lot of Andean uh, copper and gold projects, they're high elevation in Peru and Chile. Congrejos, the highest point on the project is 1,300 meters. We're 40 kilometers from a, a deep water port where you could um, export concentrates. We're looking at developing um, a couple different concentrates, a gold concentrate that could go to the Europe or US, 
and then a copper concentrate with gold in it that can go to China. So the transportation operating costs related to the proximity to infrastructure, the low strip ratio that I mentioned earlier, all bode well for the project. And um, so I think it sets itself apart from other Andean projects um, because of the proximity to this good infrastructure, uh, low elevation. It is a high rainfall area and that, that can all be managed. But um, you know, if I look at the project layout, we're doing some other things also. On page number 12 there, we've got the open pit, you can see in the upper right-hand side, it goes to primary crusher down to a plant. And we're looking at dry sack tailings facility. And basically that, um, that's you know, really positive from a water management perspective and an environmental perspective. Um, you know, there's been a lot of issues out there in, in, with tailings failures, particularly in Brazil. So there's a lot of scrutiny raised to that. And the other thing too, at the PEA, it anticipates um, no use of cyanide in the project. So from a permitting and an environmental perspective, uh, the PEA project plan looks pretty positive in that regard. Now we'll continue to evaluate um, whether we, you know, what the process flow sheet is going forward, but you know, things look good for the project in that context. Perfect. Okay, well, thank, thanks for running through some of the technical aspects there. What are the top five reasons why we should invest into your company? Listen, the team has a track record of success. Um, it's backed by Ross Beattie and, and several long-term investors that have been with us through the Lumina Copper story. We have an amazing asset in Congrejos. Uh, it still has potential to grow significantly. We're exploring it now. We have access to capital to execute and de-risk this project and put it in the position that a major mid-tier company can move it forward. Um, we've been there, we've done this. I mean, we've had high returns to investors in the past, the Lumina Copper story, which is the same group here, um, raised about $175 million and returned $1.5 billion to shareholders. We think that uh, the opportunity for uh, large returns to shareholders still exist in this story. Okay, well, that's, that's great. Look, um, it's our first time hearing this story. We'd love to catch up with you in the next couple of months and sort of see how things progress with the drilling. Okay, appreciate it, Matthew. Take care, thank you. Thank you very much for watching our video. We do aim to give you informed and intelligent information with which to make your investment decisions. So if you liked what you just saw, please give us a thumbs up. And if you want to see more insightful, in-depth, honest and unbiased interviews, then please click the subscribe button. So thanks again for watching and we look forward to seeing you again soon.